let's start with a quick poll. Have you all been in any situations where uh, you have uh, placed a grocery or a food order online, paid for it in advance, and then found out that uh, the items, more one or more items were out of stock? I've been in those situations quite often, right? So with so much tech available in 2023, it's surprising how people or companies find it so difficult to sync their online and offline inventories. Right, so this this issue of um, different channels not in sync with each other uh, appears quite often. The other day I raised a broadband complaint and uh, I got four calls from different people within the broadband company asking me for my address. I mean, come on, they should have it, right, if, if their customer facing systems are in sync with each other. Right, so that's the issue of omni-channel and issues with omni-channel that we will we will address. So essentially, Martech stacks uh, have been growing over time. They have, the number of tools have uh, exploded. I think Scott Brinker's latest uh, landscape uh, mentions 11,000 tools or something, right? But even after that, there are a lot of things that uh, we still can't do, uh, still can't do properly. So this is what then we will, uh, we will try and address in, in, in this session today. We will look at uh, the Martex tax of 2010s, the last decade, what were the issues with those, uh, what are the problems. Uh, we will then look at uh, the evolving stack architectures, uh, we like to call it uh, legless as opposed to headless. So we like to think of the last decade as the decade of uh, going headless and we think of this decade to be the decade of uh, going legless and we will talk more about that. Uh, based on this concept of legless, we will look at a reference model that should uh, uh, that should be considered as a stack for the new de de decade and then we will try and summarize this. Right, so this is, uh, this slide shows a sort of a stack that was quite popular in, in, in the last decade, right. So you have uh, the engagement channels on top, these are the channels that uh, you use to interact with your customers. Then you have the interaction and delivery environments and then you have the content and engagement management platforms. Now there are some statistics like, like the one by Scott Brinker here which says that on an average an enterprise uh, has about 91 such systems. So we can't have 91 systems here so we'll, we'll take a subset of that. Every organization will have a different subset of this but but these kind of stacks are quite popular or have been quite popular, right? But these types of stacks have major problems. Uh, and one of that problem is that it is really not trivial to do any sort of omni-channel customer experience using these kind of stacks. And, and we'll get into de details of that, right? So first, for an omni-channel experience, as a marketer, there are certain things that you need to do. Some of the things we, there, there was a, uh, an awesome panel on omnichannel goals just before lunch. So they covered a lot of these things. But essentially, you want to be uniquely able to identify your customers. Uh, you want to be able to do that across different channels, uh, across multiple transactions over time and so on. Once you have identified your customers, you want to be able to decide when and what you want to do with them. So that decision could be in terms of, um, that decision could be made using their preferences, the context of those customers and so on. Once you've identified your unique customers and decided what you want to do with them, you actually do that with them, right? So that may include sending them an offer, sending them uh, some discount, news relevant to them and so on. You want to be able to do that, uh, you want to be able to analyze this so that uh, you can increase the effectiveness for your future campaigns and you want to do all of this in a in a very planned way now we have found out that it's uh, it's it's really uh, easier said than done and in a lot of cases especially in our country the omni channel customer experience is really broken uh, let's take this example the our stack model back again so let's say you want to do personalization, which means uh, you want to personalize some content on your website. And then you want to be able to personalize your email communication in your ESP or your mail system. You also want to do some sort of personalization in e-commerce engine. 
right. So, in such a scenario, where should ideally personalization live, right? Uh, should it be part of e-commerce? Should it be part of WCM? Should be should it be part of um, email marketing? More often than not, we have found that it is everywhere, right? So, you have some sort of personalization rules in your CMS, you have another set of personalization rules in your, uh, your ESP and what that means is that if you want to be able to do any personalization, you have to have multiple sets of personalization rules across multiple engagement platforms. Now, here there are only six, but let us say you had 91, you do not want to be having 91 interfaces for setting up personalization. 91 is obviously an exaggeration, but a lot of tools would require some sort of personalization and with these con these types of stacks, they are really everywhere and the same logic can be extrapolated for content. So, let us say you want to create uh, content for your website. So, obviously, your website has a ha has a content repository. You want to create content for your email marketing. So, your email uh, system has its own content repository. Uh, you want to create uh, offers for your e-commerce website. Again, e-commerce has its own content repository, right? So, content is everywhere. I, I think same logic goes for a lot of these things. So, so, so we had a session on chat GPT. Now, AI is pretty much everywhere and we see almost all kinds of products coming up with their own AI capabilities. Now, if you were to do use AI capabilities from each of the products, then there is no way you can do omnichannel because uh, there is no way to ensure that the output of AI is consistent, consistent across each of these tools. They, they are using different models, different LLMs, all of that, right? So, so that that's that's a major problem. Right now, you might ask, what is the problem with that? What, what, what if every one of them have content, right? So here's again a stack model. So f let's take the example of WCM here. Uh, now, WCM requires its website content, right? So, it has its own content repository. Uh, it needs uh, user behavior data to be able to personalize. So, it has some sort of a user uh, inter, uh, user uh, database. It needs a personalization or a rules engine because you want to personalize it. So, there is some sort of a rules engine there. It also has its own campaign planning and analytics uh, interfaces. So, pretty much all the CMS tools have uh, this sort of a thing. So, here is an example. This is a CMS called Liferay and you will see that um, it has components for for email, uh, for, for content creation. It has another uh, another module for managing users. It has another module for analytics and it has a still another module for creating rules, right? Uh, another example here, this is, uh, this is uh, a screenshot from I think this is from MailChimp, right? So MailChimp or pretty much all the mail email server uh, email ESPs have their own similar interfaces, right? There's a campaign management interface there, there, there's analytics and all of that, right? So what's happening is that not just your WCM which has its own content data rules planning and analytics, but it turns out that all of these boxes and more in, 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 in case you have 91, have their own sets of content data rules planning and anal analytics and, and probably more services, right? We like to think of these as legs. Uh, this is where the legless concept will uh, is coming in, right? So we think of these as legs. These engagement services require these legs to stand upon, right? But the problem with this is that uh, each of these uh, each of these uh, engagement services is a silo in itself, right? So each of those silos have their own set of uh, services like content data, etc. And that is the major hindrance for any omnichannel experience, right? So, if you were to, again, same diagram, but I have, I have turned those boxes horizontally so it's easier to read, right? So, if you had to do in this kind of an architecture, if you had to do something like, like, for example, using data within your CMS along with rules within your e-commerce to deliver content to a customer service system, it will not be trivial, right? And that is that is the problem. That is the major problem here, right? And as a result, what's happening is that each of these engagement channel presents its own customer experience, which varies from very happy customer to unhappy customers and everything in between. 
right? So, so this is a summary of that. Essentially, what's happening in this model is that um, uh, your data is getting stuck in back office repositories, and that data is uh, inconsistent and certainly not actionable across channels. Um, because of that, your content experiences and rules are platform specific and not enterprise wide, right? So you have a set of rules for one system, you have a similar set of rules for another system and so on. And therefore your decision logic is getting trapped in individual delivery channels. So what you want to send or what you want to display is now decided by each of those engagement channels. And therefore, customers and prospects don't enjoy an integrated experience. It's a very disjointed, isolated, uh, inconsistent customer experience. Some more symptoms, and I think you can go through it later, right? But the key point is that with current type of architectures, it's really very difficult to create an omnichannel customer experience, right? So what do you do about this? Uh, what we are recommending here is uh, an architecture shift, which is from headless to legless. Now 2020s, 2010s, 2010s, sorry. The last decade was about uh, going headless, right? So we saw that with uh, with e-commerce tools, with the web content management tool. Uh, the idea was to really decouple your engagement from its presentation. And uh, because your engagement and presentation was, uh, was separated, you could do a much more, you could have a much more decoupled architecture and there was a separation of concerns there. Now what we are recommending is that you take that separation of concern a step forward and go with legless, which basically means do away with those legs. Not exactly, but we'll see what that exactly means. Right, so how does a MarTech stack for the new decade look like based on these recommendations? Right, so here's one example of that. Now, uh, these are reference models, right? Which means that they are aspirational and they obviously change for each organization. So this is not prescriptive, this is just an example. Right, so here you will see that uh, there is an enterprise uh, foundation services layer uh, here. And below that, you will see three, uh, three columns. There is content, there is data, and there is decisioning. So what this uh, architecture is showing is that you abstract all those capabilities that we just mentioned, content, data, decisioning, etc., away from engagement services to a layer beneath it, uh, which is what we are calling foundation services. So what this means is that um, your engagement services become much lighter now, right? So because they are much lightweight, uh, they are more agile and, and probably cheaper also. Whereas much, much of the bulk work is being done at the foundation layer. Uh, what does it mean for your tooling? What this means is that uh, you need to think of new architecture for your tools. So let's say for your WCM, you might want to shift some of the common capabilities such as component content management or uh, some other things away from WCM into a more foundational layer. And the advantage of that would be that um, because all your products, all, all your engagement services are able to access same data, same content, same decisioning, your customer experience would be consistent across channels. Um, so, so here's an example. So now your outbound marketing does not maintain its own customer data or its own content. It accesses everything from a data layer underneath. Um, so do all the other platforms, customer care, loyalty, etc. So they, all of them have access to same data. So there are three, three, three blocks here. Uh, there is content and info. So in that, uh, we see a lot of uh, new kind of product products that we call omni-channel content platforms. Uh, they are not really channel specific and they allow you to repurpose content for, for all the engagement services. So you really don't want to create content in each of those services. Instead, you, you make it a part of uh, your omni-channel content platform. The second, uh, block there is uh, data, so that is uh, a lot of customer data platforms are getting popular. What they are essentially doing is uh, they are abstracting all the data functionality away from product. So you, so you have all the customer data in, 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 in at a single place, you do segmentation, you create your segments and export those segments to all the channels, right? So all the channels essentially then have, uh, have, uh, have a similar access to 
different types of data functionality. Same with decisioning. So there are journey orchestration platforms that help you orchestrate your um, uh, orchestrate your campaigns or journeys across multiple channels. So again, you don't have to have a campaign palette for each of your platforms, like like we saw for the for the screen we saw in the screenshot of Mailchimp. Uh, example customer data platform. So there are there are several choices here, not just the big ones like uh, like Adobe and Salesforce. We track about uh, 40 customer data platforms, and you will see that uh, there are all kinds of platforms from from processing oriented to activation oriented to to suites and and all of those. So so th this is just a subset of 40. But if you look at uh, Scott Brinker's uh, map, you will probably see 100 more CDP. So there are several options. And the idea is that the, your MarTech stack of uh, 2020s is, or MarTech stack of this decade needs to be more composable. Uh, there is some debate on one co what composability means, but but essentially what we are suggesting is that MarTech, MarTech stacks are by default composable. Uh, if you were to do it with a suite, it will be less composable. If you were doing it with a best of breed product, it will be more composable. But but composability is an essential component of any stack for the 2020s. Okay, I'll stick to time, so I'll not go through these. Okay, so key summary. Uh, I think the points that I wanted to make was um, uh, for use cases such as omnichannel CX, uh, you need to modernize your uh, your MarTech stack, which essentially means that you need to kill the silos that uh, that uh, that kill omnichannel CX, uh, and therefore you have to eliminate eliminate those those isolated silos. Uh, if you have to isol uh, kill those isolated silos, what is it that you need to do? You need to be able to have content experiences and rules that are not tied to specific platforms, but are more enterprise wide, and therefore reevaluate. The necessity of having all that at engagement layer versus having that as a foundation layer. Uh, move essential services away from channel specific products and uh, and uh, and embrace a low level approach. So 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 basically bringing key plumbing services at a level lower than the engagement services. Composability uh, composability is an important component of stack. So when you are building your new stacks. Uh, keep that in mind. Well, this is mandatory slide because my company sponsors me, but I won't talk about it. Uh, I finished it on time. Okay. 